This is the second of 80 lectures on the Old Testament. We'd like to begin this lecture by discussing the subject, how big is God's creation? The first verse in the Bible, of course, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And how big is God's creation? Well, as we attempt to measure this universe, it, it is so immense that our inch and our foot and yard and even our mile measurement breaks down. And so a new method has been introduced called the light year measurement. Now, light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second, and someone has said that uh, that is the second fastest thing in the universe. Uh, the fastest thing is bad gossip, and that travels faster. I don't know, but that's pretty fast. And thus, the distance a beam of light travels in one year can be arrived at by multiplying the number of seconds in a year times 186,000, and this is roughly six trillion miles. Now, that's pretty fast. But now listen, our galaxy is made up of, uh, our universe, rather, is made up of galaxies. And a galaxy is a grouping of stars and planets. And our own glowing galaxy is called the Milky Way. Now, the Milky Way, students, is 100,000 light years in diameter. It would take a beam of light just to get out of our own Milky Way uh, galaxy here, a hundred thousand years traveling at the rate of 186,000 miles a second. It would take a hundred thousand years just to cover the diameter of our Milky Way. And consider this, astronomers estimate that about one trillion galaxies lie within the range of our largest telescopes, each one carrying within it hundreds and billions of stars. Now that's amazing. Uh, to further illustrate the size of our universe, I want you to consider uh, something here. Let's say that we're going to build a model of the universe. And uh, let us say that in this model, the thickness of a sheet of paper, just the thickness, would represent the distance from the earth to the sun. So one sheet of paper, just the thickness now, would equals some 93 million miles. And you took two sheets of paper, you'd have 93 times two. Okay, now in this model scale of the universe, to represent the nearest star, which is about four and one-third light years away, that's Alpha Centauri, that that's the name of the star, we would need a 71-foot high stack of paper. With each sheet now, the width of each sheet representing 93 million miles, just to get to the nearest star, we'd need a pile of paper 71 feet high, about the size of a, what, seven-story building. All right, now, to cover the diameter of the Milky Way in our, in our model would require a pile of paper 310 miles high. That's just to get out of our own backyard. With each, the width of each sheet now, representing 93 million miles, a pile of paper 310 miles high. Now get this next one. To reach the edge of the known universe would demand a pile of paper sheets 31 million miles high. And that's absolutely unbelievable. That's, but that's just to get to the edge of the known universe, and who knows, What's beyond that? All right, now, let me give you another illustration, illustration uh, concerning how big some of these planets are. We've discussed how far away they are from each other, but how big some of them are. If the sun were hollow, our sun, 1,300,000 Earths could fit inside. Now, listen to this. There is a star named Antares, and if it were hollow, it could hold 64 million of our suns. But that's not all. In the constellation of Hercules, there is a star which is so immense that if it were hollow, it could hold 100 million Antares. But finally, the largest known star in our universe is called Epsilon, and if this star were hollow, it could easily swallow 27 billion of our suns. Think about that. In the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth. And let me ask you this. Suppose that the pastor would say to you, all right, your assignment for, or I would say to you, your assignment for next week is to take a thimble of sand and to pour it out upon a table and count the grains in that thimble of sand. That'd take you a long time. But let's suppose that then I would say, after you finish this, then your next project is to name each of those grains of sand. Well, I would imagine you'd want to drop from the course. But do you know that the Bible says in Psalm 147 that not only does God know the number of the stars, the Bible says the, he telleth the number of the stars, he knows the number, but get this, he calleth them all by their names. He knows he's got them named. Here Dancer, here Prancer, here Comet, here Cupid. He has them all named. But one of the most remarkable and one of the greatest facts in the Bible is also found in that chapter that speaks about God knowing the number of the stars and calling them all by name. The verse before that it says, the He healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up their wounds. And so the same God that made that Epsilon star, that if it were hollow could swallow 27 billion of our sons, the same God that created Epsilon also attends the funeral of every little sparrow. Now that's how big God's universe is. And I think it's good to discuss these things because I think it's good to brag on our Heavenly Father, don't you? I remember as a boy I used to brag in the neighborhood about the things that my dad could do and how strong my earthly father is. And uh, I suspect if my earthly father could hear me, he would be proud and it would uh, make him feel good. And I think it's good when believers brag on their Heavenly Father because he owns the cattle and a thousand hills of wealth in every mind, the Bible says. All right, now, how small is God's creation? We've discussed how large it is. How small is it? Well, it's about as small as it is large. For example, it takes around 25 trillion protons, and that's one of the smallest entities we can think of, laid side by side to span a linear inch. The same God that has made the mighty stars has also made the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. And someone has said, some scientist has estimated there are as many protons in two cubic inches of copper as there are drops of water in the Atlantic Ocean. But that's not all. Each proton, remember now inside the nucleus of an atom, is held together by an invisible force which varies between 10 and 50 pounds. In other words, all these billions and billions of protons are held together by a force from 10 to 50 pounds, and in order to split the atom and split the protons one from another, you'd have to exert that much pressure. And this, of course, explains the fantastic power which results whenever a tiny mass of atoms are split and this tremendous power released, such as during, for example, the explosion of an atomic bomb. Now, it has been estimated that the total amount of energy released, or the amount of energy released by the total destruction of even one ounce of water, get this now, it would be sufficient to lift 200 million tons of rock one mile above the earth. And someone has also speculated this, I think the German physicist Otto Gale, he says that a single gram, now there are 28 grams to an ounce, of fuel uh, totally utilized in a car would be sufficient, now listen to this, for 400 journeys around the world or approximately 10 million miles. You could get uh, to the moon and back dozens of times if there was enough concrete leading from the earth to the moon on one drop of gasoline if all the power in that gasoline could be fully utilized. And in the beginning, God made the big things of the universe and he made the little things of the universe. 
Let me say something now about the complexity of creation. We've talked about its vastness. We've talked about its uh, size as far as the planets are concerned and the smallness of it as far as the, the atoms are concerned. Now, how complex is this creation? Did it just come into existence by accident? Now, as I said at the beginning, I hope when we finish this session, you will never say, refer again to the simple one-celled animal. Uh, often, you know, tiny creatures like the lowly amoeba are referred to as a simple one-celled animal. Now, how simple is this creature that God made in the beginning, in reality? Well, Sir James Gray, Cambry, uh, Sir James, I'm sorry, we'll say that again, Sir James Gray of Cambridge University, and Professor of Geology makes this uh, rather enlightening statement. He says, a cell is far more complex than any inanimate system known to man. There is not a laboratory in the world which can compete with the biochemical activities of the smallest living organism. And also get this, another scientist said that the smallest one-celled animal is at least a billion times more complicated than the most sophisticated computer down here on Earth. At least a billion times more complicated. And then there is something that scientists have come up with just recently called the DNA. And this refers to the deoxyribose nucleic acid uh, discovery. And in 1953, two scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick, and they discovered this structure of this DNA. And this is the molecule which carries the hereditary information from the parent to the offspring of all living things. In other words, the DNA that we're talking about here is the basic material in chromosomes which contain the genetic code and transmit this hereditary pattern. And these, uh, this DNA determines that uh, you are a human being instead of uh, an umbrella, instead of a dandelion. And uh, they determined that you uh, have a nose uh, uh, on your face instead of growing out the end of your big toe. So the DNA is extremely important and uh, extremely numerous all through the Bible. In fact, the total length of the DNA in one cell, and you have billions and billions of cells in your body, is six foot. In other words, the whole, the total DNA content in your body, if stretched from end to end would span the entire solar system. And this simple one-celled animal, or the simple one cell that we are composed of, we have billions and billions of cells, is unbelievably complicated. For example, someone has figured this out, that if the coded DNA instructions of a single human cell, and we have about 60 trillion cells in our body, uh, would, uh, if that was put in English, for just for one cell, it would fill a 1,000 volume encyclopedia. That's just for one cell, the information needed to create just one cell. And as I said, our bodies have at least 60 billion of these, I'm sorry, 60 trillion of these cells. But let me now uh, leave that for a moment and talk about some mysterious objects in this universe. Now, you may wonder if this is really Bible study, but I'll assure you that it is because some of these things tie in to the Word of God, and I think it makes us appreciate, uh, for example, Psalms like Psalm 139. When David says, when I consider all these things, what is man, he says in Psalm 8, that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you take uh, awareness of. And then in Psalm 139, he speaks, as I say, of him being wonderfully and mysteriously made and shaped in his mother's womb. And he said that when I consider this knowledge, he said, it is high, I cannot attain unto it. I cannot, he said, I can't fully appreciate uh, my limited knowledge here, the complexity of my body. Consider some mysterious objects in the universe. In the beginning, the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. 
there are certain stars called neutron stars. We don't know what they are, but in the beginning, God created them. Let me tell you a little about some of these neutron stars. Actually, as long ago as 1930, a scientist, Dr. Robert, uh, Robert Oppenheimer and others had predicted that the collapse of a massive star several times the mass of our sun could lead to a very stable object smaller than a white dwarf with an incredible dense uh, atmosphere to it. Now, let me just say this, that some stars, most stars, when they destroy themselves, they explode, they blow up. But some stars, and we're not sure why, they implode, that is to say, they fall in upon themselves. And uh, so if they keep falling in at the speed of light, then they become uh, known as a neutron star. And that is to say that the star is formed basically just of neutrons. And the density of a neutron star would uh, far exceed anything known in our ordinary world which would be a trillion times the density of water. For example, a teaspoon of a neutron star material would weigh on Earth a billion tons, which is the equivalent of 200 million elephants. And the following quotes are taken from Dr. Frank Drake of Cornell University. He said this, if we could go to a neutron star and simply uh, you know, uh, dip up a, a little bit of it, he said, and then if I could come back to earth and drop that on the floor, this would have enough energy, this billion tons of stuff. Now notice this, to drive all the way through the earth, to go out the other side, and then to come back down through the hole that it went through and oscillate back and forth till it finally came to rest at the center of the earth. Well, we don't know what uh, all is involved in the creation of a neutron star. But in the beginning, God created them. Then one more thing, and this is extremely interesting, and it might, it possibly might, have something to do with the biblical doctrine of hell, described later on in the Word of God. And this is a very strange and frightening phenomena, uh, recently discovered by the scientists in the mid-60s of our generation called black holes. Astronomers have added this to their growing list of strange and puzzling objects found in the universe. A black hole is the hypothetical result of a runaway or an uncontrolled gravitational collapse of a giant star. Now this is rather complex, but eventually if this neutron star that I'm talking about that implodes, if it keeps, keeps on imploding and getting smaller and smaller, it finally reaches a critical size, and this is called a Schwarzschild radius size, named after a scientist. And, uh, for example, if our sun would reach this size, it would be about two miles. It would weigh the same, but if it would pack itself into a density of two miles, now, if the contracting object continues to contract to less than its Schwarzschild radius, it becomes a black hole. In other words, the gravitational forces exerted by this object, this star, are so strong that no matter or light can escape from it. The light emanating from this object is trapped and it's effectively removed from the observable universe. Now, that may not mean a lot to you, but I want to quote something here from Dr. Kip Thorne of the California Institute of Technology, and he writes this. He says, a black hole is the end product of the catastrophic collapse of a really large star. You remember now I said it imploded, it fell in upon itself. He said, this is the ultimate concentration of matter. We believe, Dr. Thorne says, a black hole is an extremely smooth structure. It can never have ripples or mountains. Anything it traps can never escape. The black hole can neither split nor decrease in size. It can only grow, and nothing can prevent it from growing. Ultimately, if the universe itself does not collapse and die first, the black holes 
will eat up all the matter in our galaxy. Now, this is not something that some Bible-banging fundamentalist has said. This is Dr. Kip Thorne. He goes on to make this final statement. Already as much as one ten-thousandth of the universe might be down black holes. We would like to sweep this fact under the rug, but occasionally we drag it out and look it in the face and shudder. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know, even in the beginning, he might have created the permanent location of hell. Because you remember Jesus later said that hell is a place of outer darkness. It's a place of liquid fire, a place where nothing can escape. And this is a perfect description of a black hole. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus will use this, but it's interesting to tie this in. The statement that he made in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. And on that occasion, Jesus said someday that he would have to say to all unsaved, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And literally in the Greek, it's having been prepared or having already been prepared. In other words, at the time of Jesus, apparently hell was already prepared awaiting its occupants. In fact, the only place that God prepares for man is not hell. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, of course, if man refuses to accept Christ, he goes there. But Jesus says that he had to leave this earth after the crucifixion and ascension in order to prepare a place in heaven. But apparently during the day of Jesus, hell had been already prepared, whereas he went to prepare heaven. And some would tie this in with the black holes. But whatever, we'll leave that there, lest I be accused of simply lecturing from a science book here with that thrilling and profound of all statements. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, our next question, we'd like to ask when. We've asked who, God. Now, when, how old? is our earth in this universe some scientists would say that its or, or origin occurred some five to twenty billion years ago while others would have us uh, believe it's as it, it has always existed now how old is this earth in fact how can a scientist even guesstimate how old a rock or a meteorite is and there are various ways that science use one is by radiometric dating, radiometric dating, I should say, and, uh, so for example, uranium lead method or potassium argon method. And what they do here is this. They uh, take a piece of uranium, and they know, hopefully, they know that, at least they assume that at the beginning of the existence of that rock, it contained 100% uranium. And uh, after so many years, that uranium will decay into lead. So they can take a chunk of rock, and it has so much lead and so much uranium. And they know, they feel they know how long it takes the uranium to develop into lead. And uh, they can say this rock is uh, a million years old, or perhaps in some occasions this rock is five billion years old. And it's based on the decay of uranium into lead. And this is called the uranium-238 alpha decay process. But there are a lot of problems in this method, along with the potassium argon. Potassium dissolves into argon, which is a gas. And so they can take a rock and say, well, this has so much argon and so much potassium. Therefore, we can dogmatically state it's so many years old. But often there are imponderables that cause it to be impossible for them to, with exactness, to say this rock is so many years old. For example, uh, Sidney P. Clemenson, a British engineer, some time ago analyzed the published studies of rock samples from 12 volcanoes in Russia and 10 samples from other places around the world which show ages from 100 million to 10 billion years by typical radioactive dating methods. But now catch this, whereas it is known that these volcanic rocks were formed within the past 200 years. So here he took some rocks, and he knew 
when the volcano uh, erupted and made those rocks, and this was less, actually they're younger than the Constitution of our United States, and yet by uranium lead and by potassium argon, these methods show these rocks to be from 10, from 100 million to 10 billion years old. And what we're saying is this, that uh, we're not throwing the entire thing out here, all scientific findings, but we're saying that often the scientists are uh, tragically wrong in this and uh, they miss it by uh, a proverbial mile. All right, now, I believe that there may be many indications of a recent creation date. I'm not talking perhaps now just about man. I'm talking about the universe itself, and I'm talking about man with the universe, our earth, the rocks, as well as the human beings that live on it. And I'm going to suggest the possibilities that perhaps the universe, man himself, was created maybe less than 50 billion or even 50 million or even 50,000 years ago, but maybe as a little a time as 12,000 years. There are some indications that would demonstrate this, if not prove it. For example, notice with me some population, consider with me some population statistics. Uh, there are two theories concerning the duration of man on this earth. The evolutionist claims that man has been here from one to two million years, and uh, some estimate even longer. All right, now the special creationist believes that man has been here only a small fraction of time, uh, as allowed by the evolutionists. Um, do you know that uh, the present world population is 4 billion people? Now, assuming the average lifespan to be 70 years and the average generation length to be 35 years, then starting with one family, the family of Adam and Eve, or you can start in with the family of uh, Noah, make any difference, it started all over again, of course. Uh, and then you go back, and the present world population would result in about 30 doublings if you go back in history. And these doublings would carry us back to around 3,500 to 4,000 B.C. And many people believe that it was about this time the flood took place. And uh, this creation model then dovetails perfectly with uh, known world population statistics if the creation model is accepted. Well, what about the evolutionary model? Suppose man has been on earth, man himself, some two billion, I'm sorry, some two million years. Dr. Henry Morris writes the uh, following information. He says, now, if the first man appeared one million years ago, and these very conservative growth rates applied during that period, the world population would be at present Get this now, one followed by 27,000 zeros people. How big is that number? Well, no more than one followed by a hundred zeros people could be crammed into the known universe. In other words, if man was really two to four million years old and the population birth statistics were the same as they are today and there's no reason to believe that they would have been otherwise, then there would have been so much human being, uh, beings on this earth that they would have spread out beyond the galaxies and uh, beyond the solar system and that the entire universe could not possibly contain all the trillions and trillions of human beings that would have been born. Well, this would certainly suggest that man himself, let alone our earth, is certainly much less than two million years old. And then another indication concerning the earth, uh, the amount of uranium salts in the ocean would indicate that this world is less than 5 billion years old, uh, or the amount of water in the ocean. We could give other indications, the amount of helium-4 in the atmosphere. And uh, this would suggest that uh, the world is less, that the atmosphere itself is less than 12,000 years old because of the amount of helium-4. And then the absence of meteorite dust upon the Earth. Uh, Dr. Hans Peterson of the Swedish Oceanographic Institute 
some time ago calculated about uh, 14 million tons of meteorite dust of the type which contains nickel settles to Earth each year. See, as our planet goes through space, it picks up these uh, meteorites that have disintegrated and the dust falls upon the Earth. And uh, even an agnostic, sci atheistic science, uh, Isaac, uh, scientist Isaac Asimov, had admitted that if the rate had continued unaltered for the past five billion years, then there should have been a layer of meteorite dust at least 182 feet thick all over the Earth. But, of course, no layer is found. And so it would certainly indicate the absence of meteorite dust that this world may be indeed far less than the 5 billion to 50 billion years that some scientist would uh, claim that it is. And then the, vol uh, the uh, decay of the Earth's magnetic field would suggest that it is much less than that. In fact, scientist Dr. Thomas G. Barnes, who's professor of physics at the University of Texas and also an author of a widely used textbook on electricity and magnetism, has pointed out uh, that the strength of the magnetic field in our Earth has been measured carefully for 135 years and also has shown through analytical and statistical studies that it has been decaying during that period with the most probable half-life of 1,400 years. Now, that might be so much scientific lingo, but here's his statement. He says, this would mean that the magnetic field was twice as strong 1,400 years ago than it is now. It would be four times as strong 2,800 years ago, and so on. Only 7,000 years ago, it must have been 32 times as strong. And he goes on to say, it is almost inconceivable that the Earth could have ever had this strong a magnetic pull. Thus, 10,000 years ago, the Earth would have had a magnetic field, if the Earth had been existing beyond 10,000 years, as strong as that of a magnetic star. And this highly respected scientist says, this is highly improbable to say the least. And what we're trying to say is this. We are not setting a time element as far as God's concerned. We are suggesting there is as much proof, because no one knows, that this world is less than 50,000 years old or perhaps less than 15,000 years old as there is proof that it is 15 billion years old. Now, of course, sometimes people go a little too far, and uh, they attempt to say that it is, uh, well, for example, uh, Bishop Usher, we would not necessarily agree with him, and he was saying that the world could be um, less than, uh, well, actually God created the world in 4004 B.C., and his contemporary, Dr. John Lightfoot, professor of Hebrew and vice chancellor at Cambridge University, years ago, he believed he could make an accurate calculation from the Old Testament and uh, the creation of man. He actually said that uh, creation week was from October the 18th to the 24th in the year 4004 B.C. And he went on to say that the creation of Adam took place on Friday of that week, October the 23rd, 404, 404 B.C., at 9 o'clock in the morning, the 45th meridian time. Now, maybe, you know, after God uh, drank his second cup of coffee, he did all that. So we're not saying that we have to absolutely tie it into 4004 B.C., but we are saying that it's entirely possible creation took place a lot sooner in history, a lot more recent than we might have thought. Okay, now, moving on, I want to discuss briefly the methods of creation. As we said before, uh, what method did God use? And of course, there is uh, three basic methods, and one is the atheistic materialistic method. And this says that um, you give enough uh, mud, enough time, and it will all by itself create the writings of a Shakespeare and the music of a Beethoven and the paintings of a Raphael and the teachings of a Christ. That's a very interesting theory. I would challenge uh, our listeners or anyone else that would believe this to go home 
uh, tonight and uh, scoop up a, a jar of mud uh, from your backyard and put it in your pantry shelf on your pantry shelf. And how long do you think it would take that jar of mud, uh, if left alone, to the, turn into a tulip or a barking dog or a human mind? Do you think you could do it in a million years or a billion years? And yet that's what the atheistic materialistic man says. Uh, I quote here from Dr. George Wald of the Scientific American magazine, August 1954, but that's what he's saying, that if you give enough mud enough time, it'll do this. And he says, time is in fact the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal is that of the order of two billion years. Now, of course, they backed it up. Now they say it's far more than that, but this was in 1954. What we regard, he says, as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable vir virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. Is that right? Let me ask a question here. How long do you think it would take for one million monkeys typing away day and night on one million typewriters for just one monkey to actually type out the first ten words in the Bible. The words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now here's a million monkeys, and let's say they're non-union monkeys, and so they're working 24 hours a day, and uh, they're just randomly typing, and they're attempting to type out, or they're not even attempting, we're attempting to get them to do it by accident, just for one of those million monkeys to type out one time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, some scientists fed this to a computer in New York City, and it blew out some tubes, I think, and short-circuited. But it can be done. But are you ready for the answer? Here's how long it would take. Consider a rock which reached from the earth to the nearest star, which was some 26 trillion miles away. All right? Now, that's a pretty big rock. Now, once... Every million years, a tiny little bird flies to this massive rock and he removes the smallest grain of sand from it. He flies away and he rests up for a million years. And then the next million years, he comes back and pecks off a tiny, another little tiny grain of sand. Now listen, when not one or two or three, but when four rocks this size have been completely carried away down to the last grain, then one of those monkeys would have accidentally typed out Genesis 1-1. I don't know about you, but I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. They have to have more, far more faith than what I do. All right, now the second theory concerning creation is called theistic evolution. And this is the second proposed method to explain creation. Let me define this. This says that the processes used by God by which all living organisms have developed from the simple to the more complex forms uh, can be thought of in terms of theistic evolution. The word theos is God, and evolution, of course, is that method. So they say, uh, we'll take this method. God used the method of Evolution to create all things. This form may be thought of, then, as the mosaic Darwinian theory, for it earnestly attempts to unify two seemingly irreconcilable philosophies. This is also known as the molecule to man, or the atom, A-T-A-M, or A-T-O-M, to A-D-A-M, the atom to atom theory of origin. Well, there's some difficulties, though, with this uh, method, and uh, one of the difficulties that it would seem to contradict God's overall purpose of redemption. For example, it was unlikely that God would waste billions of years in aimless evolution before getting to the point. The Bible says that he created in six days, and yet these days would have to be millions of years. As an example of this, what about... Uh, a hundred, the hundred million year reign and eventual total extinction of the dinosaurs. So it uh, has a problem there, contradicting God's overall purpose of 
of creation. Not only that, but theistic evolution seems to reduce Adam to a spiritually transformed ape. And without attempting to ridicule the position, because many sincere Christians believe this, and we do not question their sincerity, we do not question their spirituality. But uh, here they would say that God would reach down and put his hand upon an existing male baboon or a male uh, sub-animal creature and breathe into his nostrils a breath of life and then uh, this uh, sub-creature would become man, would become Adam. And then God did the same thing with a female uh, gorilla or monkey or whatever and then this uh, female would turn into Eve. So here we have uh, suddenly uh, two of these subhuman creatures and they throw down their coconuts and they kneel and begin to uh, pray and then stand and sing the hallelujah chorus. Now, perhaps I'm oversimplifying it, and I know there are many uh, fine believers that believe in theistic evolution, but I do not believe that it is tenable as one studies the scripture. For example, uh, it seems to be refuted by Moses, where Moses says, "...in the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man did not, uh, d did not begin at the bottom of a sea, as the evolutionists would say, but man began uh, in the Garden of Eden as God created him uh, from the dust of the ground. And not only that, but the Lord Jesus says in um, the New Testament, he says, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? This, of course, would not have been true had God simply transformed an already existing male and female ape. With this, we will close the second lecture. May God add his blessing to this his word. Amen.